And I actually have here a, a letter uh, was written to me uh, by, by a, a fellow who was very, very fond of, uh, of the Lord of the Rings. And he asked me in the letter uh, why, why they didn't just... Simply play another copy of the One Ring and and uh, um, sacrifice the first one to, to the legend rule. And I I, I told him I I, I get this, I get this uh, same question the the people run into me at the pub and ask why why didn't they just okay, cast a second one? Uh, it would have made the quest a whole lot easier. And I I told him uh, the same thing that I, that I'm telling you right now. Uh, you know. Uh, Shut up. Do you want to do a quiet one where we're really close to the mic? We're just talking? No. Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Lucky Paper Radio. My name is Andy, and I'm here, as always, with my co-host, Anthony Proud, owner of a brand new laser cutter, Maddox. Pew, pew, pew. Lasers. How does one cut a laser, exactly? Oh, you totally misunderstand the core concept. It's oh, cutting no. with lasers, not cutting lasers. Yeah, I just got a laser cutter in the mail. I'm really excited about it. It's a thing that I've kind of wanted for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, but it feels Basically, like... Basically, ever since a... you got to use the laser cutter in college. Yeah, do you... So, okay, I was trying to look up this project I did in college, and I feel like I was pretty manipulative... Not manipulative. <laughs> uh, what do you call it? Pretty consistent, pretty good about documenting my work and keeping all my files, but I can't find any evidence. Pretty good at manipulating my work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Do you remember that that balsa wood dirigible that I made? Sure do. I did make that. Okay, so it's real. Think so. Okay, great. I don't know what ever happened to that. I guess I just threw it away when we had to move out of the studios, but... I will say you were very good at documenting your work that was digital. But it started digital. Like, all the files were You still have all your files. other files from college? Yeah, absolutely. F- fettered away? I have them in a like, completely disorganized pile from some yeah. backup, it, but it would not surprise me to not be able to find a file from back in the days. Anyway... You're going to um, make another dirigible? But that's, that's, on, the, that's on the list. That's on the list of things to experiment with. But Perhaps I was a bloop! With, Parker a few weeks ago about uh, geometric patterns and coasters. He's apparently really into coasters. You know, there's, that's the thing you don't really know about somebody until you really sit down and talk to them about coasters. What do you mean he's really into coasters? <laughs> he just really likes coasters. Uh, specifically, you know, tiling geometric tessellating coasters. Oh, I mean, I'm really into when they discover new tiling shapes. Uh-huh. That's a pa- that's a passion that's of mine. So often. What, there was a big, brand new one discovered last year that was a big deal. Oh, that's cool. It was like the best tiling shape, too. Anyway, so that sort of was the latest time that I was like, maybe I should think about a laser cutter. And then I went and looked at one that I have looked up every once in a while the last couple of years. Uh, and it was on Super Sale. And so I was like, okay, this is, this is time. There you go. The Super Sale has spoken. The Super Sale works. The sales work, it turns out, folks. Turns out when you sell a thing for twice as much as you need to sell it for, and then sometimes sell it for a reasonable half of profit that. margin. <laughs> well, I'm excited to see what you cut with lasers. Me too. I hope I don't. I don't know, I guess. Probably the worst thing you could do is inhale a bunch of bad fumes. Yes, that's, that's probably the that's, worst you could do. That's exactly what I'm worried about. Yeah, and don't punch the mic stand either. Okay. It's time for our annual tradition, Anthony. One of our many. And this annual tradition is the one where we read Mark Rosewater's State of Design article, which he puts out every year sometime in August-ish, end of the summer. And we comment on it in our State of the Game episode. We've done this now for three years. This is our third year running of our State of the Game episodes. I have a question to start us on, Anthony. Okay. Is this even for us? The state of design article? You mean, are we the target audience for this article? That's kind of what I mean. Yeah, let's start yes. there. Okay. Uh, I think, yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I've kind of been thinking about this a little bit the last couple of weeks, to be honest, because, you know, we've, we've talked to some serious game people recently. We had the privilege of talking with Richard Garfield on the podcast. Serious game uh, person. We read the beauty of games and sort of i think got and then a lot subsequently of talked a lot to frank hi frank <laughs> yeah uh, hello frank i didn't actually i wasn't on discord that much that week but good to good to see you pop in frank and I, I, it just has me feeling a little bit self-conscious not self-conscious but sort of self-aware that i'm not as into games as much as a lot of these people and so it feels a little bit dissonant that we have a podcast all about games but well, i think what i'm more into is just like more broadly is systems and like the way things yeah. work and so when i approach magic 
that's just one of the many systems that I'm like, yeah, I want to go really, really deep into this and learn about how magic works, even if I'm not as into games more broadly. And I think you're also an artist and a creative person, and Cube, in the way we talk about it, is very much a creative pursuit. Totally. And so I think that, you know, all that being said, I'm very much the kind of person that is going to go listen to hours and hours and hours of Mark Rosewater's Drive to Work podcast, because I just want to know how it works. I want to take the lid off and tinker around and see what, what goes into this. And I think that that's exactly the, the, the kind of person that he's writing these state of design articles for, is the people that are interested in a little bit more about what's going on and what's changing and evolving and the lessons they're learning as they design this game and iterate on it year after year. Do you disagree? Do you think that well, there's a different... I think this is definitely not for the casual gamer that's just, you know, plays Arena once every couple couple days. I think it's for anybody that reads the Making Magic blog, which is a lot of people maybe that don't care about game design so much as they care about magic. Magic is the thing they care about, and sure. anything related to magic is interesting to them. What I more mean is that, like, I do think it's written for a more general audience, and I think the audience this is written for is getting more general as it goes on. If you dig back through the archives, I think you'll find a lot more kind of in the weeds discussion of more actual R&D things. And this year, the article drew some commentary or criticism from people that it was very kind of meatless, just kind of shallow, and just kind of said there were good things and bad things about every set. And I actually don't agree. I think it had just as much depth as recent years did. But I do think the overall trend is to be more kind of like a report card for all of Magic and less about like, here's what we learned behind the scenes at the R&D department. What I more meant, though, is... Do Wizards of the Coast care about us? Oh, um, no, probably not. We don't spend any money on the game anymore. Like, in in some senses, we are not really invested magic people in the same way that I think they imagine most of their invested audience is. It's like it's like to say that... Um... Which I just want to acknowledge at the front of this, because, I mean, we're going to share our opinions on all this, of course, and if you're really invested in magic, just know that Anthony and I are really invested in Cube, and magic is a part of that but our investment in magic more broadly has definitely well it didn't start super high i would say compared to some other people that might have a podcast weekly about magic and it has starkly waned over the three to four years that we have been recording the show and talking about the state of the game yeah i mean I, it it's not fair to say that we spend no money on Magic. I'm definitely still planning on buying a bunch of singles to update some cubes in the next month. But I'm not Very little at for the me. state where I'm going to, you know, three sealed events every pre-release and also buying a box and also buying yeah, a bunch I've, of other stuff. I've missed the past few pre-releases and some of them I missed because I was traveling. Other ones I was just like, I don't want to, I got other things to do with my Friday night. I don't know. Yeah. That was like the one thing I still did that was like regular, not cube magic and... Yeah, I don't know. All to say that, like, you know, just from a honest reporting perspective, that's where Anthony and I are coming from, especially listening back. I listened to a little bit of our past two episodes of A State of the Game, and I think we're even more so in a place where if something about magic is not serving us, we just check out of it and maybe don't spend a bunch of time engaging with it, whereas other people will be like, I don't know, in there fighting the good fight, trying to make the game what they want it to be, and you are just kind of like, all right, well, bye. We'll make the game we want it to be over here. I don't know. I mean, I had a great time casting, what is the name of this card, Dr Dalric or something? This, like, giant monster I don't know. with what the are you tentacles talking about? coming out of it from, like, Mercadian masks, and it has this... Derelich! Derelich. The one where you can sacrifice yeah. three black creatures instead of pay its casting I got to, cost? I got to curve Sengir Autocrat into that uh, twice on our Did last cube night. Did you do it twice? Twice. Sick. One time, it was not actually a good move, but I was like, look, that's what I came here to do, so I'm gonna do this. <laughs> yeah, I was casting Dragonstorm to go get... Oh, nice. Blade Wing the Risen and Tika's Dragon, and then reminding myself repeatedly of the Rampage rules text. So yeah, yeah, we're not. So I get we're what, not I, normal Magic. Players. I get what you're saying. It's like we're still pretty engaged with Magic, but in a way that is not necessarily. Uh, yeah, I mean, the Magic is a product. They're making it to sell it. So in some ways, when they're making the big board of psychographics of who do we need to care about in order to sell Magic, uh, you and I are not as much in line with the, those demographics as. I might think at first blush. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean, like you said, we're invested in the game as a system, a creative system, a toolbox, a set of building blocks to make something cool. Not at all as a product, not at all as a company, not at all as an IP. Like, I don't think you and I are invested in that even a little bit. I mean, I still got my collection. I'm not parting with that. No, I parted with a lot of my collection this hmm. year, but that's where you and I are different. That's the one thing Mark Rosewater says. Don't sell your collection if you're getting out of the game because you might want it one day. Of course he would That's say that. That's not the one thing he says. He of says course he would of say that. He says a lot of things. It's true. Okay, so you think this is still is for us? 
I mean, yeah, and honestly, I think that that's sort of an interesting, weird exception that Mark Rosewater especially is just such a vocal and, and is willing to sort of go out and say a lot of things about magic, about the way that they produce it, that many other companies wouldn't, because many companies are just secrecy by default. That's just the, the, the operating model. And Yeah, the classic sign an NDA before we have our first meeting is, yeah. what are you going to tell me? It, and I think that Nothing. that's that's like a great resource that magic has, and I think that Mark is just legitimately really excited to share with people that have that sort of fascination with the game so yes i agree that in some ways we are not the first tier of target demographic mark is also not necessarily doing this just because it's it's the thing that supports the brand the most okay do you think this year's state of design is meaningfully different than past years it definitely felt that way to me to me it felt a lot more a lot thinner, a lot more wishy-washy. A lot of the paragraphs, honestly, I would not necessarily even have been able to tell you. So he splits this up set by set and then with, within each set into lessons learned. So, you know, things that they can improve on and highlights, things that they did really well. And a lot of the paragraphs I'm reading, I'm just like, this could go in either because you've just said some people like this, some people didn't. And a lot of the sort of lessons learned are also not, here's a mistake we made, here's how we're going to improve it in the future. It's sort of just like, Oh, the lesson was some people didn't like this. It feels much more of just a reporting of consumer opinions and less interesting, in-depth design criticism. That that was my read. Yeah, I I feel that. The biggest thing that felt different to me is in past years, I felt like there was kind of a a thrust to the overall year. thesis, like, you know... Here Two was, years ago, here was Lorwyn Block, and uh, complexity was the biggest issue. That's what you know. Our, our big thrust for next year is how do we rein in the complexity in a way that we're still keeping things interesting while making board states more reasonable. Which obviously, for is, example, which obviously is a simplification. But like two years ago was the year where you may recall we talked about it in the podcast. Mark mentioned Commander, I think, like 30 times in the article. Oh yeah, and literally no other format appeared in name in that year's article. This year, Commander is not once in this entire article. I checked. Uh, so I think Mark has learned that. And that was two years ago, to be clear. But that was the year where he also came out with the article that was designing for an eternal world, which was this sort of big article in the magic design space and talking about how Commander related to the game more broadly. And like that felt like a very clear right. identity for like, here is the primary issue we are wrestling with yeah. as a game right now. And here's how it reflected in our product. Yeah, that's a good example. I mean, I almost wonder at this point if... That shift has happened. Commander oh, now it has. is it fully has. Commander is magic. They're so not it's even like saying it anymore. He because, doesn't have to say it. Yeah, because exactly. It's, I mean, even somebody uh, this afternoon in in the local local Discord was like, "Oh, Popper Knight is that a uh, is that that's uh, Commander Popper, right?" <laughs> and I, the couple people trying to keep Popper alive are just like, "Nope, it's sixty card constructed." But it's just yeah, people just take for granted that uh, everything is Commander now. Right. So I think that is a change that just happened. Right. But like three years ago is when we were looking at that, or two years ago. Last year, the theme was nostalgia, and you may recall that they, after sort of dabbling in a bunch of more thin, sort of top-down themed sets, returned to, like, the Brothers War and Dominaria and a bunch of, like, sets that were coming back to Magic's original IP, which I think was a much, I don't know, a less clearly defined theme. But, But this year, if there is a theme, I think it's lack of focus. So, yeah, I mean, to your point, a lot of these paragraphs about these mechanics or sets could go one way or the other. So it's just kind of maybe lack of focus. Like maybe the game is becoming so big and the audience is so broad that you can't really have a cohesive story you're telling about what's going on with the game. Yeah, I think that that is part of it, and there's probably a lot of related things that that go along with that. So I was thinking, you know, assuming that that is the case, that this is just a little bit less deep, it's a little bit more conflicted, lots of different ideas from coming different directions, then that does make sense that, you know, as the game is growing, they're just going to get so many feedback from so many different people, and it's less about just these sort of uh, very invested players, and more about these people that just came to Magic because they were interested in Lord of the Rings, or interested in The Walking Dead, or they saw it on Arena, which is much more accessible. So I could definitely believe the the narrative that they're just... I think a lot of Magic as... players that have only ever played a Commander game and just have oh, never played a one-on-one game of Magic. Poor, poor people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be too salty. I mean, like, look, Commander's cool. It's got its place. But I think there's a lot of players that are in that spot. And it's yeah. like the cards that sometimes we'll gripe about, like all the choose an opponent at random or, you know, whatever kind of cards that just don't work or are functionally very different in one-on-one. There can be a whole suite of cards that those same players would be like, who wants this card? Who cares about this 
Oh, another removal spell. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, I, genuinely, I bet there are a bunch of people that feel that way about new cards. I mean, that's yeah. the that is the curse of having a broad appeal, I guess. I also thought when I read this that it was a conspicuous omission that it seems to me like what is maybe the most prominent and biggest like conflict or issue in magic right now wasn't addressed in this article and that's just the pace of releases Mm -hmm. i see people talking about this everywhere all the time that it's just too much they're checking out they're not paying attention he even says in his own article he's only covering things that were right he's like i can't cover all the stuff that wasn't a booster product it has to be a booster product for me to be covering it in this article so even even mark is like i'm not doing everything because it's just too much yeah and i think that's related as well you know it's not just the player base that's growing the the company making the game is growing as well and i think that just means that mark is touching a lot of it less because he he's only one person he has not tripled in in capacity uh his already ridiculous capacity to manage so much so well, what i was gonna say just, is that, that that doesn't i guess that's not really a design thing and that's exactly like yeah. that's a business strategy thing and you know i think maybe someone might read this article and think it feels like a state of magic but it's not it is a state right. of r d and r d is given a mandate to make x number of sets a year and that is beyond the purview of their range of things they can be Right. Reflective it's, it's, on. it's not like Mark is there in vision design saying, we need to come out with three more sets a year because we're not able to tell the story well enough. So we really need to, you know, make the game more compelling by adding more cards. Absolutely not. It is a, a business decision, like you're saying. And I, I also, Mark Rosewater just did a, a podcast, which I thought was going to be more of just a reflection of this article. But yeah, he ended up just talking about the in general, like what these articles are about, which is also kind of interesting because he was talking about the history of when he started doing them and how his role the company has evolved. And in that, he sort of describes this sort of pattern of as the company grows, what was one person's responsibility now splits into two and then splits into three people's responsibility because there's more and more work that just has to get done. And I wonder if there's a similar pattern there where, yeah, I mean, he's just not, he's still the head designer, but that doesn't mean he is as involved with every single set as much as he used to be. At the end of the day, all that said... I mostly agreed with and felt buoyed by the things he did call out as at least the like high level lessons. Yeah, I mean, you said there still was a lot of meat here for you. So what was that really? Well, I went there a lot of meat, but <laughs> it, it it didn't feel like it was dancing around the topic. It felt like it was addressing the things that need to be addressed. And a lot of the lessons here are things that you and I have griped about. We try to keep this podcast minimal on griping because we just like to focus on things we like about the game as much as we possibly can. But, you know, it happens from time to time. It's hard to avoid completely, especially when we do set reviews, you know, where we're forcing ourselves to talk about our product that we might just ignore if we didn't otherwise, you know, want to talk about it. But something we've kind of griped about is his first lesson here, which is we were too on the nose with our tropes and basically says that, yeah, we just like took all the jokes a little too far and all the sort of... You know, everybody's wearing a hat. Everybody's wearing a hat was a problem, is what he's saying. Yeah. Does it feel good to see that there for you? You know know how I feel about that. (laughs) But I mean, does it feel, to see Mark acknowledge that, do you feel like this is our collective voices being heard? And do you think this is going to affect how they do things going forward? Honestly, no. I mean, I think this is this is a me problem. I think that, you know, they're doing all these... It, it's not just the Outlaws of Thunder Junction, everybody's wearing a cowboy hat now. It's that, plus all the crossovers and universes beyond. It's all just... It's a very different product. And I think sometimes if I'm critical about it, people will push back and say, well, look, Magic is super successful. They're making so much money. Like, clearly, you're wrong. And it's like, well... I'm not saying they're not making the business decisions that don't make them the best money. I'm saying they're not making the decisions that make this a game that I think is deep and satisfying and gratifying to get into. It's not the game that I'm interested in. So, like, yeah, they might still be being a successful product, but they definitely are changing the game from what I found most interesting about it. And it feels more just like walking down the Hallmark aisle or the cereal aisle, and there's a bunch of weird, wacky characters. And it's like, that's not for me. That's not my taste. But that is a me problem. The the conflation, at least in this country, between financial success and success more broadly is so deep-seated that it is difficult to have any conversation with somebody often about different kinds of goals. Because I hear that too. I'll make a gripe on Twitter about magic and it's like, well, that was the number one selling set of all time. It's like, okay, cool. You know what else sells really, really well is insert pile of garbage that I think is artistically empty and meaningless and a waste of everybody's bottle water sells really well oh. like it's a very popular product that does not mean that i think it is a success and a good thing so it's hard to have those conversations and 
for what it's worth, you know, I like Mark Rosewater a lot. We're big Mark Rosewater fans on this podcast, but I think he is, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid every day, right? Like, I think Mark does pretty strongly conflate sales with success of a set and them doing a good job and succeeding in their goals. I mean, a lot of ways he has to. That is his job. Right. I mean, that's what I mean by drinking the Kool-Aid, right? Like, this is how this is what you get paid to do. Your job is to is sell magic that, cards. Is that what that metaphor means? Yeah, exactly. I think that's what it comes from. It comes from a bunch of fans of Kool-Aid uh-huh. okay. that thought, this is such a cool product. I'm going to drink it a whole bunch. Cool with a K. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is that I think that because it is a presumably a core metric of how he measures his own success as, you know, at, at his job, you're completely separate from creative fulfillment, artistic expression, that there's really no way, I think, for him to divorce that from his evaluations here and actually talk about these sets, absent things like sales numbers and crap like that. But yeah, I, I don't know. I kind of agree. Like, I, I don't... I can't think of a good metaphor here, but when I when I read this and him saying we're too on the nose with our tropes, what I feel like their takeaway is going to be is that, like, we got to hide it a little more. <laughs> like, like not we have to, like, change our approach and, you know, be more fundamentally creative and, like, lean less on campy, shallow media. Just that we have to, like, disguise it a little bit more so that people have fewer cards to point at and say, look, you just put a hat on a hat. Yeah, I mean, I think there's also, like, kind of an interesting tension. I'm curious how you feel about this, where let's take the Lord of the Rings set. It's not to my taste that they're doing these crossover sets, because I think that having, like, a cohesive narrative in the game was really powerful, made it something really powerful. That being said, I kind of like Lord of the Rings, and uh, I do think that Lord of the Rings is a a separate, deep fiction uh, with a lot of interesting world building, and a lot of that they did bring to the game. So it's sort of like we wholesale just, like, get all this depth, figure out a way to make it make sense mechanically so that what the cards are doing kind of resonates with the narrative of the story, So, like, that set in particular felt much more deep than Outlaws of Thunder Junction. But, like, is it the same kind of depth? Is it as compelling to you as a player? If I'm honest and I, like, just check in with my, like, gut reaction, I I like the Lord of the Rings set. I liked it. Honestly, if it had normal card frames, I think I would just love a lot of those cards (laughs) a lot. I mean, the, like, appearance of, like, named characters and stuff kind of irks me a little bit, but... Just, you know, fantasy stuff and, you know, a magical world that, as you said, has been thoroughly fleshed out and has a deep lore and meaning behind all the decisions that were made. I just like that set. And sure, I contain contradictions. I don't think Universes Beyond broadly is a, like, great look for magic moving forward. And I think it's kind of evidence of the game debasing itself a tiny bit to appeal to a broader audience and become more of a, like, Marvel-style product. But yeah, in this case, I thought it was a good set, probably in no small part to the fact that they probably put a ton of resources to Mm -hmm. designing and developing that set because they knew it was such a high stakes thing. Probably a huge investment for them to pay for access to the IP for Lord of the Rings. They had to pay off, right? Like, There's other reasons I think it's good. I don't think it's good because it's a Lord of the Rings crossover set. But yeah, if I just do a gut check, I like that set. I like it a lot more than Outlaws of Thunder Junction. I like it a lot more than Murders at Karlov Manor. Like those Those sets were completely forgettable to me and if it wasn't for the fact that we forced ourselves to spend one and a half to two episodes talking about them i probably wouldn't even have a thought about them at all i'd be like i they would just pass over me like water off a duck's back yeah the the detective tropes that all really was it was really just as he describes in this article like paper thin and it's i think that i don't know i think there's something that's really powerful about really great fictions and really great world building that you kind of have to build so much more than you actually put into the end product such that there is a cohesiveness that as a somebody who is experiencing the fiction you feel that there's like some underpinning ideas underpinning themes like there's a reason this kind of holds together and if you don't do that work things just feel kind of like not really cohesive and he even mentions that they did do a lot more world building and there was a lot more depth behind outlaws of thunder junction but honestly I didn't feel it. (laughs) Like, I didn't get the sense that there was, like, a reason why all these things were happening. It was just, like, a bunch of legends from other stories just all kind of here in this weird mishmash. Maybe we'll just jump around to, like, individual set stuff, too, because I did overall like Lord of the Rings. I I did think that I shared the opinion of a lot of players that the ring-tempting mechanic having no downsides, which we talked about in the show, right. was such a weird decision because it seems to fly in the face of exactly what that whole thing is. Yeah, I mean, talking about making the cards mechanically resonate with with the flavor of, of the story, 
that was an absolute miss. The fact that the the whole thing about the story is like this comes with great power, but it's also entirely corrupting. Like that's the whole thrust of Lord of the Rings, and yet it's just like, oh no, having the rings actually just great. The other like quibble I have with that set that I can like point to is the card, the One Ring, which was unabashedly incredibly pushed and is still shaping up a bunch of constructed environments. It seems like the again what the One Ring is was not really. Brought it's, to the game in a meaningful great way. In multiples, it's so good in multiples. Just like the real One Ring, if you were in the in the Lord of the Rings <laughs> story, if you had multiples, trust me, you would put them on. <laughs> it just seems like it was the perfect opportunity to write. You may only include one copy of this card in your deck uh-huh. on the card. There may there may and only it be both... one copy of this registered at any given tournament. <laughs> well, and it would have both been like a cool callback to like old school legend rules some some era of the old school legend rules there were a lot of old legend rules that came and went as they sort of honed in on what it actually is now it would have fixed a lot of the balance issues in competitive formats because the fact that there are multiples and you can crank one up to a bunch of bird encounters and then play another one to get rid of that recurring loss of life is part of why it's so good and it also just draws you into your more of the one rings like it would have been a better card probably for like the health of constructed formats and also just more resonant that and the, like the treatment of the ring tempts you mechanic. Those are like little signs that just make me feel like for all the work that went into that set, it was still a like kind of shallow effort that just happened to be drawing on a really deep pool of original IP. But like those things kind of just fell flat in terms of how they actually relate to the underlying idea. Like, the cohesive design of this game piece from the resonant flavor all the way down to how it behaves mechanically in the game. Just, I don't know. It's like little signs that, are you really, are you doing it? Are you doing it right? Or are you just kind of, you have so much good material here, like so many good ingredients here that it's hard to make a bad dish, but the underlying thrust is still not the direction that I would choose, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I get that. The, uh, the next note here, Anthony, is some individual mechanics were too complex. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely something that we've come back to again and again, and I feel like I'm just getting old and grumpy, but I, I mean, you mentioned you don't make it to every pre-release. Honestly, I feel like the complexity on the cards makes it so that I cannot have the same experience that I used to have going to a pre-release pretty blind and, and just understanding by the end of the night sort of like what's going on. It's just a lot of work to try and evaluate a pool of c- cards of the current complexity from scratch. I don't feel that as much. I think going to do a sealed pool of a new set is fine. Most of those cards are commons, and commons are still not pound for pound very complicated. It's really on the like rares, and even some uncommons now, it's bleeding into where they're giving themselves a lot more rope with the complexity. And I think he worded this very carefully here to say some mechanics are too complex, because I think he can't admit the thing which he's alluded to in the past and is ultimately true, which is that the whole game is just more complex because they're dramatically ramped up the number of new game pieces they're printing every year and there's only so many things you can do with these core fundamental elements these core resources and rearranging how you can relate to them without dramatically pushing power level or printing a bunch of unplayable cards like you've got to just do new stuff and you've already done all the simple stuff so the fact that the entire game is getting more complex is maybe more what you're feeling than like what he's saying here which is that oh a couple mechanics We could have done a better job on and like I think what he's alluding to here is like putting ward on the disguise creatures right it's like oh we made it unnecessarily complex it could have just been morph and it's like sure but that's not really what you're talking about you're talking about sort of the accumulated weight of just all of this new and complicated stuff definitely yeah. But they seem related because every time they come back to a uh, remix a, a, another mechanic, like you're saying, they do end up having to make it a little bit more complex because they've already done the simple iteration of it. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's definitely related. I just think that what he's saying here is not that we're going to try and make the game more simple broadly. Mm-hmm. He's saying we're going to try to have less egregious mistakes on specific mechanics that are very obviously more complicated than need be, which this one seems like an intractable problem of just... Like, this is the natural outcome of printing 2,000 new cards every single year and all the lines having to go up constantly. This just seems like this will eventually be, like, you know, the death knell of magic someday. I'm not, you know, I'm not a the game is dying, the sky is falling person, but this trend will continue to some degree and something's got to give at some point. Yeah. Which is why I think he has to just say, like, well, some mechanics we went too far on and we'll try to be better about those, but we're still on this train going up this hill, you know, even if we take a few fewer uh, like steep inclined you know jumps we're still 
go in that direction eventually. I was grateful that he specifically mentioned logistics here, I will say, which I think is something that we feel a lot in paper that really never comes up in digital magic. And digital magic logistics is kind of by its very nature, completely handled for you. The cards just do the things you're supposed to do. You mean the, the logistics of just playing in paper, what's happening on the table, moving cards around, representing tokens? Yeah, and like I guess that. there's actually different logistics in digital because there are some cards that are awful digitally that are totally fine in paper. So it's really kind of different logistical questions. So maybe he's not talking about paper as much here as I think. But my paper bias read in this that he was alluding to mechanics that might be fine digitally because logistics are handled, but when you actually have to physically move things around or physically track the counters on a crystalline giant or whatever, I know that example is from a card from five years ago. That, that to me is like a, the logistics problem. Uh, yeah. So you're talking about like roll tokens, for example. Yeah. Roll tokens are an okay example. Like the ring temps you is a great example where it's like, okay, this just says the ring temps you on this card. It doesn't say what, what that actually does oh, at yeah. all. Better hope you have this token that has six paragraphs on it to explain what that means. Right. And when you're playing the game digitally, I've never played the game digitally, but I assume you could like see when you're looking at a card, what the ring temps you does, or at the very least you just play it and the thing happens, right? Like if you're not thinking too far ahead about what all the effects are, you at least are going to play the game correctly by the rules because of the way it's implemented digitally. I feel like that's kind of what he's talking about there. Unique, yeah. unique tokens, that kind of stuff. I think that's true. And I think he's actually mentioned, not in this article, but in other articles, that that's something else they've been thinking about is is especially the, the sort of token situation. Because, yeah, I mean, I think that for people that play Cube especially, that can become a little bit of a challenge. But, I mean, going back to your point, like, Cube players are really not the target audience, uh, both because of scale and the way that we interact with the game in a lot of ways. Also, to be clear, most Cube players have tons of tokens in their cube and barely care you and i are in the minority i think for like very carefully yeah, okay. metering that and most people will play a card if they like it if it makes a new token maybe it's a tiny downside but which is fine i mean cube players are pound for pound some of the most invested magic players that probably know what all these cards do you put all the cards in your cube you probably know what they do so i get it i get why that happens but i don't think that they're thinking about the cube players when they think gosh new tokens and that's okay. <laughs> it's totally okay. Here's the thing. I don't need Mark Rosebar to think about me. It's fine. He's got a lot to think about. <laughs> it's fine. I feel like this next lesson kind of sums up maybe the overall thrust of the article, which is just more mechanics were polarizing than previous years. I'm actually going to read this like two sentences here just to lay it out for everybody. Mark says, one of the things I noticed when mapping out my notes for this column was how often a mechanic ended up as both a highlight and a lesson. I am a big believer that we want to make things that some people love, even if others hate it, but I don't think being polarizing should be our goal. I don't know what to make of this, because what Mark is talking about when he refers to like feedback here is stuff he hears on social media, which is on all the social media platforms, especially his Tumblr, where he answers 55 questions a day and has answered... 50,000 questions. It's insane. He's like the only person still using Tumblr. <laughs> like, I think if you looked at Tumblr traffic, mm -hmm. it would be like Mark Rosewater and then some weird horny anime Tumblr that someone's still using. So he gets a lot of direct, very biased selection of feedback that way, right? The people that bothered to write to Mark Rosewater specifically are invested enough to know who Mark Rosewater is. They're angry enough to go and like send a message. So it's a very sort of biased sampling. And he's also referring to the surveys and stuff that Wizards of the Coast does at the end of every set, which, if you don't know, they do a big survey that you can fill out at the end of every set where they ask you your favorite mechanics, your favorite cards, least favorite mechanics, least favorite cards. You rate everything with numbers and stuff like that. And I I'm led to believe that they work with some sort of analytics firm to, like, find people to fill that out. And probably some people are getting targeted ads or emails about filling this thing out, even though I've never gotten that. It's, it's also just publicly linked. If you're on the website at the right day, you'll find a link to it. Right, but... To the point, that's another very self-selecting audience, the people that seek that out. Bias, like, yeah. I imagine whatever consultant, or maybe they have their own team internally that's entirely focused on this, I imagine one of their goals is to try and hear from people that are not just the people that are seeking these things out. But that's where this is all coming from. I have to imagine with the scale at which they're operating, though, isn't every mechanic always going to have good and bad things about it? Like, is, Can this really be a difference, you think, this year? I mean, to me, again, I feel like so many of the mechanics from this last year, I mean, especially thinking about things like the dungeons and the ring tempts me, it's like, or tempts you, uh, it's just so... Dungeons wasn't last year, right? It wasn't, but it's, I'm just, this this whole sort of sure category of mechanics that it makes sense that they're polarizing because I think if, if this is your first thing, maybe this is your first introduction to magic, you're like, yeah, that's the way it works, no problem, but I'm just like pretty overwhelmed by them. 
so yeah, I mean, I think that part of this is maybe going back to just the audience is shifting, so he's going to get a broader range of different responses uh, and from more different people. But I also think a lot of those individual mechanics were just, like, really intense. And I think that maybe I'm just in a situation where I just I just don't necessarily need another mechanic like that. Off the top of your head, can you think of a mechanic from the last year that you liked? Uh, yes. Nope, that was from last year. <laughs> What's the one where it enters, you put a counter on something else, and you grant it the abilities? Backup? Backup. 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 I liked backup quite a bit. Okay, well, that was last year, so you still okay. haven't answered the question. <laughs> Um, all right, let's let's scroll through these. Lord of the Rings. Eh. So Wild off the top of your head, no, but now we're looking at them. Oh, well, I'm just looking at the set symbols. Is okay. that okay? <laughs> sure, that counts. That still counts as the top of your uh, head. Because I can mostly remember them. We had more adventures. We had rolls. I thought rolls were pretty cool as a way to just like get a bunch more enchantments. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of fiddly logistics. So I'm not like all in. This is a slam dunk. Lost Caverns of Ixalan. So many more double face cards. And the Descend stuff was all kind of fiddly to send was confusing and he mentions that he actually uses yeah. the exact word fiddly here i'm not sure if you <laughs> noticed that he's not wrong outlaws of thunder junction let's just keep scrolling <laughs> what were the mechanics in that set spree i did kind of like you like uh plot quite a i bit. did kind plot, of like let plot. them do a lot of interesting plot is kind of cool designs, but plot's probably my favorite mechanic from the past year probably uh, and then we have modern horizons and that was mostly, that's just recurring mechanics, right? There's maybe one or two weird little new things. I think it's just recombinations of yeah. things. I don't think there's new named mechanics. Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like mechanically, it's hard to even remember a lot of these things, which again comes back to the fact that like I'm not, if I played a bunch of limited for these sets, I'm sure I would have different ideas about this Definitely, stuff. Definitely, yeah. But my exposure to these cards is whatever cards I or the people I play Magic with have decided to include in their cubes from those sets. So it's like, I don't even think about plot as being a mechanic. I think of Slickshot Show Off right. as being a card yeah, yeah. that is cool. Or, I mean, I do like Pitiless Carnage a lot in the uh, Ornithopter Cube. So, yeah, I think plot is actually probably my favorite from the past year. Spree, I like modal mechanics, but that's one of the most offensive in terms of just like menu of options mm -hmm. that are likely unrelated to each other. So, but where do we land? Do we think the more mechanics were, in fact, polarizing? That That's certainly how it felt to me as well. And it, I... I I agree with his challenge here that, on one hand, you don't want to approach designing something in the sense of trying to make everybody kind of happy, because like you can't make everybody delighted. Obviously, that would be the goal, but if you're going to make something that's going to delight some people, other people are not going to like it so much. So, even though his goal shouldn't be to be polarizing, it's kind of a side effect that you can't avoid, that if you're going to make something that's going to be great for some group, other people are not going to be so into it. And I think, I think he's, just, he's just feeling it in an intensity that it's, like, difficult to rationalize here. I, I don't think that argument holds water. It's a thing that artists like to say a lot, where it's like, oh, if you're not offending anybody, then you're not making great work. And it's like, actually, no, you can make great stuff that doesn't offend anybody. Like, it's actually totally possible. Like, is it? Yeah, I think it really is. Like... Pound for pound, Mr. Rogers didn't offend anybody. People did not hate Mr. Rogers, right? It's a different axis, whether you want to make something that is, like, pushing people in one way or the other versus just, like, the quality of the thing. I don't think making a good thing means that inherently some people are not going to like it. I'm going to have to think about that. I think it's I'll a story people tell you. themselves when they get success and popular and they think, well, now I have a bunch of people that hate me. And it's just not, it's impossible for me to be this popular without having a bunch of people that also hate what I do. And it's like, kind of, I guess, but that ratio is like, it's not like an equal number of people love and hate Mr. Rogers as, you know, love and hate Ben Shapiro, right? Like, oftentimes what you do invites, the creative output you produce invites strong reactions negatively, which is not intrinsically tied to making something good. I mean, that's definitely true. It's not like these things, it's not like there's only one axis here of you only make bland or polarizing. You can also make things that are just crap or are just great. Well, no, I think bland and I polarizing is maybe an axis. It's just that there is another unrelated to well. the quality axis. Like it's not, it's not even correlated, I think, to the quality axis. I think that there are effects <laughs> between these things, underlying correlations. I'm sure there's some deep things tying things together, but I, to me, it's they're much more separate than I think a lot of people imply. A lot of people imply that in order to have, to really impact people in a positive way, to make something that's really meaningful to people, you are inherently going to like drive a bunch of other people away, and I don't think that's true at all. I think so that's think a story they, people tell they, themselves they to cope. It's cope. shooting for everything is great, nothing has to be polarizing, if we could just really excel at this. Yeah. 
Okay. I mean, I think to use magic as an example, like some sets, a lot, a lot of people love. Almost everybody loves. And it's not like those sets have huge detractors because a lot of people love those sets. Other sets are much more controversial regardless of their quality. Like Neon Dynasty felt like it was a very beloved semi-recent set. Yeah. Do you I know don't... anybody that really, because so many people really love Neon Dynasty, that's like, ah, seething at the mouth about how much Neon Dynasty sucks and they hate it? I don't. Um, I'm not saying those people don't point. exist. I'm sure a small spattering people are out there doing that, but I don't know. This is, we don't have to go down this road too much. I'm just saying I think that the reason you hear that is not because that's the thing that intrinsically makes sense. I think it's because those are people trying to cope with criticism and justify not making everyone happy all the time. Which you don't have so, to I mean, do, do you, that. do you think it is like just to to flip the way we're talking about it? Do you not think that if you're making the thing that is most broad appeal, you're having to cater to the least common denominator, and therefore you're making something that is going to be more difficult to get some people really passionate about. Well, I think it's a, I think broad appeal is different from having strong negative and strong positive opinions. You can have a small group of people that have almost universally positive opinions about it and almost no detractors. It doesn't have to appeal to a huge audience fundamentally in order to be non-controversial but then it's maybe just more about uh setting expectations and creating things that people will self-select to just not engage with negatively because it's just not for them yeah that's an important part of it too i agree so i don't know i feel like that's almost the same thing just with like a better framing as far as like better framing as a creative work that you're trying to get people to engage with in a certain way yeah i mean like Magic as a game is not going to be for everybody. It's complicated. It's deep. It requires a lot of investment to get a lot out of it, I think. But I think Magic as a game is still the greatest game, one of the greatest games ever made. And I don't think there are a ton of people out there that... There's a bunch of people in Magic that... Like, the people that will say the worst things about Magic are the people that are Magic players. Oh, for sure, yeah. Like, there's not a huge (laughs) group of people that are like... I don't play Magic because I hate it. (laughs) Well, yeah, it's just like... I hate it because I play it. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. Let's not get too distracted on that. Okay. I'm not, I guess I'm not sold based on the contents of this article or the things I've read around it that these were things were necessarily more polarizing versus Mark or Wizards of the Coast just trying to justify the fact that, yeah, I mean, if people are going to like things, people are not going to like things. And instead of us saying that we no longer have a focus in terms of who we're trying to please, we are just going to say things are polarizing. Okay. So what you think, you, you would just substitute the word bad here. The ring tempts you was a lower quality mechanic than some other things, and they're framing that as polarizing. I think in the past, if they got, I'm sure on every survey they've ever run, they've got for positive and negative things about every mechanic they've ever made. And I don't think this year it's that those pieces of feedback are like more imbalanced. There's more 50-50 or they're more extreme. The, the like is more intense and the hatred is more intense. I think this is more a byproduct of them continuing to broaden their focus and yeah you're gonna have fundamental conflicts if you're trying to make cards that are great for retail limited and also commander those are like wildly different contexts to your point of like expectation setting if a booster pack is supposed to contain both of those then polarizing is inevitable and in the past this might have been a question of like well let's focus on an audience that matters or let's you know decide what our focus is going to be now I think it's just that our focus is everything, which means that things are going to be polarizing because we just can't please everybody all the time, and we're still going to be shoving these cards on everyone's throat because that's our sort of corporate mandate. Yeah. I mean, here's where I really do feel like there's a difference in this article from past years. I'm just clicking through some of the previous ones, and there are very explicit points that are made. You know, uh, we messed up with dragons. There's like a, a, a big flavor error we made that people didn't respond to in the way we expected. We made dragons or, small. Uh, you know the dragons needed more variety or we misunderstood how this would be perceived. Like there's just really, really concrete things that are pointed to. And this is just a lot of some people liked it. Some people didn't. It was kind of polarizing. Well, that's what this point is specifically. That's what I'm saying. I think this lesson here is kind of a, a reckoning with the new world that magic is in, which is that you've got a bigger audience with more varied expectations than you've ever had in the game. I think that's a good take on that. Yeah. With more varied expectations and, you are recognizing all of them as valid. Not that I'm arguing any of them should be invalid, but the burden on a booster set right now to cater to all these different audiences is heavy. It's a heavy burden. And, you know, we see whole products come up like Modern Horizons because they were like, well, we're focusing on so many things and we're kind of missing on this specific eternal format that we really like. Let's, you know, 
focused on just making modern different with this modern horizons product and then we see products focused specifically on commander because we're trying to like focus on just commander and then ultimately though it also comes down to the fact that like they're still printing out effectively one product with these like little tendrils coming off of it that has to cater to all these different audiences and i think that is the fundamental challenge of modern magic is that you're going to have to put a bunch of commander cards in there. Otherwise, you're going to have 600 commander YouTube channels talking about how the new set's trash for commander. And you're going to have to put a bunch of good limited cards in there and like make sure the limited format is balanced. Otherwise, you're going to have all the limited podcasts and limited players talking about how Wiz doesn't care about limited anymore. And then you have the modern players that are like, how dare you print Nadu? What's your problem? Why'd you print Nadu? This is like totally broken. How'd you not know Nadu was going to be broken with Shuko? It's like, there's just too much. Like the game... I guess I keep coming back to lack of focus. It just feels like the game is unfocused. Like, what does Wizards care about most? Other than, you know, growing and making money. They care yeah. about the bottom line. Like, for a long time, it felt like what Wizards cared about was the rotating competitive format. Like, standard right. is our focus, and everything else kind of just flows from that. That's clearly not the focus at all. I can't... I mean, does anybody talk about standard? I mean, I'm sure... I see standard talked about so much less than all these other things we've already addressed on this podcast. You know what? The only thing I've heard about standard in the last, uh, let's call it year, is standard's actually better than you think it is. <laughs> and it's like, interesting. It, standard, I don't have, think about you at all. <laughs> people have, have mentioned that it's actually better than I think it is and more active than I think it is, but then nobody says anything else about it. And yeah, I mean, I think that that sort of structure of the way the whole ecosystem of magic worked made a lot of sense. It's like, here's our premier rotating format. The fact that it's rotating solves a lot of issues of power creep and keeping cards fresh. But hey, if you want to operate on a slower cycle, then there's modern and then there's legacy. Like there's there's layers of expanding formats, but there's this cascade between the way that cards flow from one format to the next. And, and also, when you, you have, never, and when I, you have the premier format now being commander, which is so fundamentally a different game like multiplayer drastically changes the way all the cards work you just yeah you're not you're not printing cards into this sort of like somewhat linear waterfall of formats it's it's like yeah they are just trying to do two very different things at the same time and now we're just back to talking about design for an eternal world which you know right. was two years ago but it's still resonating I, I just think like you said we're in the world now where that is no longer like a change we're processing it's just the world now yeah and i think it feels like magic is unfocused. And that comes through in a couple places here, right? The next thing, the next lesson here is planes need to feel more ingrained in the bigger picture. I got a lot of feedback on world building this year and the core message is that people want the magic in, in universe sets to feel more like magic because it feels like the game is just kind of shattered into a bunch of little pieces. And the lack of focus feels like it is the core lesson here, but it's not something he ever mentioned by name. Right. I mean, he, it's, it is also kind of funny that, you know, Universes Beyond has been a big thing, and it's, it's been a big topic, and there are many detractors of it, and the response has often been, well, there still is the core magic. Like, magic for you is still there. There's just also more on the buffet. Don't worry, here's Oko with some spurs. And then it just feels like, of course you're going to have some induction between i keep thinking about induction the last couple days i don't know why it's just like yeah the universe is beyond is happening here and that's going to affect the way these other things are being designed in parallel like there's there's no way that those aren't going to influence each other so i don't know all of these products that are designed in specific formats and stuff it just feels like they're trying to like patch the fundamental problem which is that magic is everything and then you look at modern horizons and it's like okay how many cards realistically in a set focus at modern are going to actually see play in modern if you print 12 or 20 that's incredible that's going to completely shake up the modern metagame and you still have hundreds of other cards in that file and then it's like okay well this is actually all commander product as well mm -hmm. and it's also a chance to print cool cube cards that people couldn't get in other sets which of course we're grateful for because that's the format we like to play but also we're going to care about the limited format like it's not even like they let them actually do, do the thing that they say they're going to do right like the only time they actually let themselves do that is when they just print commander decks but even then now we get like more confused commander product like, have we gotten Commander decks with the recent sets? I thought we got, like, we get Commander sets now, right? Um. <laughs> uh, Do you just yeah, still get no, pre-cons with pre -cons every set? There are pre with every set. Okay. And then sometimes there are also, some of those cards from those pre-cons, I think, will also be in Collector's Boosters. But then there will right, also be cards collector's booster thing, but that's that not are a thing anymore. part of the Commander sets that are in just Collector Boosters that aren't in the pre-cons but they're still part of the commander set it's 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 crazy and making it, the commander decks is the one thing where it feels like they let themselves just make the commander decks yeah like there's nothing in there for the limited players naturally there's nothing in there for the says mr broadside bombardiers i i hate that card <laughs> never mind <laughs> i think it's really powerful i don't like it okay okay 
I mean, retail limited, obviously, you're not playing any of those cards, except for when well, you, you are. Well, you are. Sometimes, <laughs> if they're in the bonus sheet uh, or whatever. And I guess, theoretically, they could be paying attention to, like, eternal magic. Yeah. There. You, they could care about legacy in those products, but I don't think they're thinking about that for the most part. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that, like, this is the State of Design article. In so many ways, magic design as a game has just gotten really refined. They've really honed in their craft. They have their set skeleton. They can apply a new flavor, build out mechanics, and it's just like, it works. They do a good job of it. The things that have impacted our experience as players is not necessarily the fundamental game design. It's like, cool, we have this couple new cards we enjoy playing Commander, but really what's had an impact is the fact that they've redesigned the way that sets come out. They've redesigned the booster pack three times. They've come out with all these other ways that the product is sold and the way that the product is presented. It's like the things that really are impacting the game right now are not game design decisions, but like business decisions and and product marketing decisions. So it sort of makes sense that this feels a little bit unfocused because that's the the game design is not the thrust of it right now. You know, my gut reaction to that was to be like, well, surely it's always been the business driving things, but that's absolutely not true. Like for a long time, this was just kind of lightning in a bottle. They were like, oh crap, everyone loves this. We got to make. We it don't really set. understand why. We're just like hitch our business to this horse and let us ride into the sunset, like as long as it will go, basically. And it does feel like that is not the way it is now. It feels like the corporate entity has an a handle, a like idea now of why this is successful, what makes cards sell. And they are sort of creating a skeleton that the design team is then filling in. As opposed to at least the first few years, let's say, at the very least, probably for a little while longer, but the very least the first few years, it was just like, no, just more cards, please. <laughs> just who cares? Just more cards. Any any more cards would be great. Uh, people are buying no matter what, whatever we sell, people are buying it. So I don't care what you make. Just make more magic, right? That is not the mandate now. The mandate is so much more constrained by the fact that this is a, a multi-billion dollar company that has all of the pressures that a multi-billion dollar company has on it in America in 2024. Yeah, that's got to be a lot of pressure. I want to end on our favorite things from Magic for the past year, Anthony. Okay. You know, undeniably, this has been a, a, at least a moderately gripey episode, but... Oops. I think Sorry. you and I probably have the same favorite thing from Magic in the past year. What's yours? Is it is it cube? Grassroots cube <laughs> events. Yes, of course. Grassroots yes. cube events, which I think we maybe even talked about this a little bit in last year's episode because there was inklings on the horizon this thing might be coming but now we're living in that world i mean you and i have been to five cube events this year I think it's gonna be five yeah if it isn't already i mean boston cube party cube for a cause steel city cube you went to capital cube mm-hmm. champs which i didn't make because i was ill so yeah i guess cubecon is gonna be five to me the growth and success of these events is the the best thing about magic right now for sure it's interesting because there's a really small group of people that I think are willing to actually travel to events of this size, right? Yeah. Basically like us and Greg and Jake <laughs> and Dan Schneider and Zach Barish and, and like Bones, obviously. And and Bones who's judging the vast majority of them. There's like a small group of people that are like willing to travel for these things, but mostly like there was not a ton of overlap, I would say, at the attendees of Boston Cube Party and Cube for a Cause in Brooklyn, even though those two places are separated by a, a very very short flight or a very reasonable train or whatever like they're easy to get to one from one to the other but for the most part those events were local boston area people and local new york area people that were just excited to come out and play cube and in a lot of ways that's the audience that i'm most excited for and about right now and they're not listening to this show to be clear it's the sickos like us and great we're the ones that are willing to travel right like we're the sickos listening to this show most of those local people just got heard through a friend that, you know, maybe is a little more invested in the cube scene. This is the thing that's happening. But that's the audience that I feel like I am most excited for right now in Magic, where it's like, yeah, you just got to come out for a weekend and play a bunch of fantastic limited Magic, which <laughs> I have a whole thing. I, th- <laughs> I don't want to get into okay, it right now. No, let's do your whole thing. No, I, I, have a th- I think playing cube a whole bunch really changes your expectations for what constitutes a good game of Magic. And if you... It's casting Derelict after your... <laughs> and if you serves. play a bunch of cube and, you know, spend a bunch of time thinking about your cube and trying to shape the games you want, I think you then come to realize that most games of Magic are not, by your definition, good games of Magic. And I don't know. I think playing cube is the best way you can possibly draft. Way better than just drafting a retail set, for sure. So 
I'm excited for those people and excited to see more of these events popping up. And it seems like they are at least moderately sustainable. The people that have run them have not lost a ton of money. Some of them have made a little <laughs> bit of money in some cases. But also, I know that those people are not in it for the money. They're in it because they love this game. They love this format. And so that's by far the best part of the year for me. It has nothing to do with anything Mark Rosewire is talking about. But it is for sure the thing about Magic that has me most excited about the future. For sure. And I think to underscore what you're saying, the fact that these events are very much just pulling from their local communities. I think that's all upside. If it was just a bunch of us weirdos just, you know, meeting up in different cities, that would also be great, but different grade because it's, it's cool just to see that, yeah, these local scenes are beginning to grow and, and more people are getting exposed to cube in this way that is especially about drafting very different designs that people are doing. It's not just about here's the one MTGO vintage cube that we're all sort of having this one shared experience. It's, you know, I went to this location and I drafted this weird cube that I wouldn't have that experience anywhere else. Or like, not even that weird. Like, I'm very... I don't know. I mean, I'm a, I was at Capital Cube Champs and somebody's asking about how does banding work? And the judge is just giving them such a hard time about banding. It's like, that that was pretty weird, but it's also really satisfying to be like, yeah, you're not going to have this kind of, it, it's like the right amount of competitive spirit where like everybody's there to play seriously. People aren't just goofing off, but also they're goofing off the right amount. Like they're, they're still having a good time with it. Before Steel City Cube, Bones asked me to take humility out of my cube. And I was like, Bones, are you asking me? as a friend or are you asking me as the head judge of steel city cube is this a mandate and bones was like i'm not actually gonna make you do it but i strongly encourage you because otherwise i'll be doing humility calls all weekend and sure enough after the first round he was like two humility calls so far <laughs> sorry for not cutting that bones have, have a whiteboard with the humility it has been it's zero been minutes 14 minutes since, since, since the, the humility. last humility judge call <laughs> yeah no i think that's great and to be fair for all of our criticism or observations that magic is maybe unfocused maybe a little bit fractured and for all that i have honestly mourned that like i think it was we talked about this last year but there was a time where i felt like saying i was a magic player meant something and then it meant that i have something in common with somebody else who was a magic player and we could share common ground and i truly no longer feel that way like if i met somebody that played magic at an event which i like if i was at like a wedding and somebody else like played magic and i met them at the buffet Mm -hmm. we probably don't have anything to talk about these days, right? They probably play Commander and probably mostly, if not exclusively, Commander. And like our experience of the game is just completely different. And maybe I could explain what a cube is and they would go, interesting. Have you heard of Brandon Sanderson's Commander Cube? And I'll go, I sure have. And that's our like some total common ground. So yeah, I have more into that. But for all that we have like talked about that and griped about it, I also think that it's because of the size and expansiveness of magic that we can have our little nook if magic was half the size it was we wouldn't be able to have these little cube events because there'd be that much of a smaller pool that we're drawing from to try and get people into this thing so for all that i will continue to be lovingly critical of the mothership i will be happy to continue hanging out with my friends in the warmth of its exhaust of its wake and doing our own little thing what a beautiful little image you just painted there for us Got anything else? I don't know. It's It's been a year. I mean, magic is definitely just, it really does feel like it's changing a lot. And I think that, I think I'm agreeing with you that, yeah, we just got to make sure we're focusing on the parts that are really enjoyable to us. And uh, I think that there are still, there's still a lot of enjoyment we can get out of this game for a long time, assuming we just, yeah, manage to, to stay focused on what's working for gotta us. Got to manage your own expectations. Yeah. Yeah. I actually like... Looking back at this year, I didn't feel like this year was that different, which is like, I felt like these big changes happened, you know, around fire design and then in the designing for an eternal fire world design era. design is not really a thing. That's a, that's a whole other Like it or not, <laughs> like it or not, that was a like, there's a clear delineation. You yeah. can look at the types of cards that were printed and the nature of them, whatever you want to call it. I want to call it, I want to call it designing for commander. <laughs> okay, fine. Well then with Eldraine, when they started designing for yeah. commander... That's when I feel like the change happened, and that was, I mean, Eldraine was 2018 now? You know, So here, here's what the last year felt like to me. 2019? They introduced a lot of these changes. You know, here's a bunch of different frames. There's multiple kinds of booster packs. There's a that's whole bunch also more been, that's, that's more than like, a year. That has all been happening for a while. This is the year where all of that just felt like the status quo. Yes, exactly. Precisely. This is the year where it's like, 
we're looking at all this stuff and we're not even like we didn't talk about any of the problems with that because that's just how it is now like yeah. we don't talk about that anymore because now we just talk about how it's so polarizing <laughs> it's polarizing sorry for being polarizing sorry Mark. for being so polar <laughs> i should have called you a polar bear at the beginning would have been cute polar bears are scary they are also kind of cute about have polar you seen bears that video today, or yesterday no there's a video of this person who's doing some North Pole exploration and they have some crazy vehicle with like huge wheels that can roll over, you know, a bunch of ice and t tough terrain. And then oh, it's, it's got a bad time for one of those. And then it's got a hatch on the bottom that you just like pop out of to like go explore and take samples or whatever. And the hatch is like a little ladder on it. And there's this clip of this guy at like the top of the ladder with like the hatch closed and there's just a big polar bear sniffing around oh, no. just wanting to eat him and he's safe inside his big vehicle but the polar bear's face is very cute when it's right there <laughs> <laughs> it just is there like i understand he's a killing machine but also it's a very machines. cute little face i i mean since we're fully just going off the rails now i've been reading this book about refrigerators and it's crazy the sort how of how cold a box can get it is that's exactly i mean you, you, if you watch akira and you're like that's a crazy fantasy no that's real <laughs> no i remember but, reading at some point and maybe you're about to say this that we have made colder temperatures here on earth than have existed anywhere in the universe artificially okay no this is a little bit more practical it is just okay. really about refrigerators but uh more it's just that you know there there are a lot of people that work in places like you're describing in very cold environments doing research and stuff there are many more people that work in extremely cold environments that are totally artificial because our whole food supply is, or our whole supply chain is in refrigerated warehouses and people got to move stuff in and out of it. And that's driven like the hoodie was invented for people working in refrigerated warehouses. And now is like this huh. normal thing. And that's and crazy. The companies that make the clothing that Arctic explorers wear, most of their business is making clothing for people that work in refrigerated warehouses. And then it just happened that they did a better job than the people that were formerly designing the Arctic U.S. military <laughs> gear or yeah, the U.S. military. They probably do a good job of that, too. Um, but, yeah, it's just crazy to think how much refrigerators have transformed so much about our society. Yeah. And then all those refrigerators running all the time to keep those warehouses in make everything Florida hotter. cool, make everything huh? hotter, thus which getting rid of all the to, natural cold which area. Which means you have to get even more refrigerators we have to put everything in nature's refrigerator antarctica and the north pole and then get rid of all other regular refrigerators just go if you want something fresh go to antarctica <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't it, it, that doesn't work that way but no i, mean, I, I know, know i know you do but just just to be clear <laughs> just has to be said just has to be said <laughs> All right, on that bombshell, that is the end of this episode of Lucky Paper Radio. We didn't read any card text, so there's no chance we get anything wrong, so nice try trying to correct us. All the music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All the magic cards are produced by Wizards of the Coast. This podcast is produced by Anthony and I, thinking really hard about magic cards and then speaking into microphones about it. Anthony, thank you for the gift of friendship and for the gift of Cube. And thank you for the gift of bizarre rotisserie draft which i'm just gonna tease a little bit i think you're probably I'm gonna be really so excited, excited about, about, about this. this and i i couldn't i wanted to make it the intro and i was like i won't be able to control myself uh. <laughs> just explain the concept to our listeners we're gonna should talk we? about should it on we? a or should we just yeah explain the concept okay, okay and then we'll talk about it on a episode in the future when the draft is over and you and i would not be breaking the rules by talking about it outside of the discord right, we channel. can't talk about it uh so patrick was like what are we guys rotoing today uh, when there was no plans to do a rotisserie draft? And I said, 360 random cards. And like, and everyone said, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, be right back while I do some JavaScript and generate a list of... I made it 420 cards, just, just so we had a little more space. Yeah, we talked about it a little we bit. We artificially and ended inflated up, the land count a yeah, bit. Yeah, people wanted then, to inflate the land count, which I was against. I think full random is the way to go, but people wanted some extra lands in there. And then we just made it a little bigger so that we had to play just a little less of the Ultra Chaff because there's no fewer than like six cards in this list that actually do nothing, that are just like dead cards that mm -hmm. are completely irrelevant. Right. Which is funny. Card that's like, oh yeah, return your commander to your hand. It's like, well, I don't know about that. Yeah. And there's like the orb that says players can't search their libraries and like perilously few things that even search libraries in the entire pool mm -hmm. i felt a little trolled by this pool because it felt like you put your thumbs on the scales in other ways and i'm sure you didn't but i the uh, only other modification i made was the handware garrison and handware battlements is that, no handware whatever the, the meld cards scryfall actually treats that as a card on the back face so that got randomly put in and then there was also a duplicate of something else so i was like you know what i'm just gonna cut that duplicate flip these two cards over 
How bonus. was there a duplicate? Was it because it had unique names from a like? No, don't worry about it. Okay, fine. Jumbo I won't worry about reasons. it. No, I was gonna say that this card pool. First of all, no shocks, no fetches. <laughs> three triomes. <laughs> three triomes. Three triomes. Also, did you count the number of combat tricks in this random pool? No. It is insane. There are so many combat tricks. I am so certain. I think there's the normal amount. I do not think there's the normal <laughs> amount. There are far more than the normal density of combat tricks in this pool. I am certain of it. There are so many of them. That's all we can say right now because we can't break the rules of the uh, the rotisserie draft. We can only talk about it in the channel. Can I just say I'm shocked about the first two picks that I got? Um... Yeah, we can say things that happened in the past. Yeah. Oh yeah, the past we can talk about. I, I thought for sure the card that I first picked was going to go in the first three. I I was strongly considering it. I think that color. I can't say anything. Else. <laughs> I can't. I can't say anything else. I think on raw power level, you have probably the most powerful game piece <laughs> in the pool. I I think so. But. It costs four mana, and uh -huh. to get the full power out of it, you also have to take a fairly risky activation and also sacrifice three other creatures, which... But that, for that, the low, low cost of all of that, you win the you game. You win the game. You win the game almost certainly. So for reasons... I, I can't... I just can't. I can't talk about it. I agree. I think your your first pick made it later than I expected it to make it. And then I think your second pick was, you know, uh, you had to... It's obvious. Right? Yeah. Like, those two cards are the best two cards in that color, and it's by a, like... A pretty, sizable pretty margin. Pretty big margin. Yeah. I don't know. I think that I'm excited for my third pick, too. But. I specifically pulled out what I believe to be power outliers in every color. Uh huh. And those were the only two I pulled out in that color. I was number seven in the rotation, so I kind of got to ignore it. <laughs> Let everybody else tell me what colors I was playing. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't pull out Salvation Colossus? Okay, so I'm really enjoying this. It cost 10 mana. <laughs> only eight mana. <laughs> this is. No, the next best white card, you don't wonder what it is? The next best white card. I do know what it is. It's the dragon. The 710. Really? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the apothecary white. Nah. Sorry, you got to beep that. Because, oh, wait, no. Mm. We just have to make everyone <laughs> listen to it. Everyone in the Rodo has to listen to this conversation. That way we haven't had any conversation outside of the Rodo draft. Let's not talk about white cards that other people should take. <laughs> I think the dragon's the next best card. That also says you win. I, yeah. And also blocks and you The only costs win. one less than the salvation clauses. Okay, here's what I want to say about this whole experience. Is this has been the most fun way so far to engage with universes beyond and absolutely like all these kinds because it's just like oh yeah there's a lot of like reasonable magic cards and then, here welcome to jurassic park <laughs> <laughs> jurassic park <laughs> and what was what is that other card that uh the writers of whatever writers of the mark writers of the mark it's like oh here's the seven mana thing that costs one less for each human you control like how many humans are there in this random pool and not that know. many it turns it's, out it's like in this like dose and like weird context it's been it's been fun to read those cards no i agree yeah i think there might be a Nice little uh, page for our website if you wanted to to polish it up where somebody could check a few boxes that say like always include the two halves of Mel guards or you know whatever or include like you know no universes beyond or something and generate a random pool for at their the own very, for at their the own very enjoyment. least if somebody's going to want to willing to figure out how to install node modules <laughs> there's an option for them <laughs> Anyway, I'm excited about this Roto too. It's I'm so much more excited about it than any Roto we've done of a cube recently, which is saying That's something. That's really wow. Burn on all the cube designers. No, I mean my own cubes too. I don't know. Like it's just so much more interesting to feel like we are doing real card evaluation mm -hmm. because this meta is so much more unknown. Like what is going to matter in these games, I think is so much more open to interpretation than in a typical cube that everyone has drafted before. We'll see. It's gonna be weird. Anthony thinks Elesh Norn is going to matter in these games. <laughs> I hope so. Anthony thinks a saga that says make 10, 10 worth of power and toughness, then next turn put a plus on plus uh -huh. one counter on all of them and give it double strike. Simply attack for 30. Simply attack for 30. Well, one saga. That'll do it.